All righty, and welcome everyone to another episode of Broken Family, where we host conversations on divorce, parental alienation, and high conflict relationships. My name is Andrew Faulkner. And I'm Barbara LaPointe. Today, we're going to dive deep into the topic of parental alienation, highlighting nine pitfalls to avoid with your alienated child. Yeah, and these are fantastic. I think they're going to be really valuable. So I'm just going to run through a few of them, Andrew. Okay, so again, these are nine things, nine pitfalls that you may want to avoid when seeking to bond with your alienated child. Number one, don't tell your child that they're being brainwashed or point out that they're being alienated. What do you think, Andrew? I think uh, it's a very strong number one, simply because there's so many parents out there that want a silver bullet for alienation. And unfortunately, it's not like that. When you tell your child that they're being alienated or you tell them that they're being brainwashed, they're going to react and say, are you trying to tell me that I can't think for myself? Are you trying to tell me that these aren't my thoughts, that these aren't my feelings? How would you know what my feelings are? How would you know what my thoughts are? And a good example, I think, of this is uh, imagine you go to dinner with your family, with some of your extended family, and you talk to that one person that you disagree with on politics. And then you tell that person that they are brainwashed, that they are uh, being lied to, that they're falling for the propaganda, that the, that the government is trying to make them think certain things. And you imagine just how angry that person would be. And it's going to be the same kind of feeling when you talk to your alienated child. You can't tell them that they're being brainwashed. You can't tell them that they're being manipulated because they've already inculcated these beliefs into their entire way of life. They've already, they've developed a certain set of guidelines for themselves and for somebody to come in and tell them that they are not living their life as it should be, they're going to say, well, who are you to tell me what to do? Does that make sense? It does. And um, it, it really does in the context of a break in the bond with the parent and uh, also with uh, parental alienation. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of that is just because the child doesn't respect the parent anymore. When after a certain point where the estrangement has carried on for a certain amount of time, the child is going to treat the parent like a stranger or like that distant uncle or relative that they haven't had much contact with. And so to have that person who has no rapport built up come in and tell you, this is how you should live your life, they're not going to respond well. It, another common pitfall that kind of links in with this is where many parents are looking for experts to tell their kids, hey, you're being brainwashed. And unfortunately, that doesn't work either. It doesn't work if it's one thing to have a doctor tell somebody, hey, you have these symptoms and therefore you have this prognosis. It's another thing entirely when we're talking about the psyche, simply because having some random person come up and phone, phone you up and say, hey, you're being brainwashed. Again, it's someone with no rapport, someone who has no uh, connection to you coming in and telling you how to live your life. And nobody likes that. And as a result, it, it's very jarring and it can really dramatically hurt your relationship with your child. Some great points there. And I think that all nine of these uh, pitfalls to avoid really um, focus on being neutral and bringing around neutralized language or at least de-escalating highly charged emotional languaging. So let's keep, let's keep rolling here with as a parent and again we're, we're talking about when there's an estrangement or a break in the bond with a parent, don't engage in manipulative or abusive behavior. So I'll highlight these points. Don't pretend to be a psychologist. No gaslighting, please. And do not give your child ultimatums. Yeah, definitely. It's, it goes without saying that we shouldn't engage in these kind of behaviors. 
And sometimes when we're most angry and most upset, it's easy to give in to these urges because uh, maybe it feels like it's the only thing that works. The truth is it is more damaging than you can possibly imagine. And to put your child through more manipulation and more abuse is going to hurt them and make them less trusting of you in the long term. So when a parent comes in and they're realizing that they've been alienated and many parents will immediately rush in and start doing as much research as possible. I mean, I was like that. So many parents are doing all this research and what ends up happening is now they think that they're an expert. Okay. They've done all, they've done several hours of reading. Now they think they know what's going on. Now they think that they can just doctor the situation. And it doesn't quite work that way because you're going to find out that, you know, many psychologists spend, was it six to eight years or so just training to be in a position where they're able to counsel somebody and stand in a point of neutrality. It's not something that you can, you can study up and, and learn in four hours. It's not something you can learn in four months. There's so much more out there and, as you continue down this journey of learning and whether it's the psychology field in general or parental alienation or high conflict personalities, you're going to find out there's even more and more out there that you just didn't know. I mean, just learning from you, Barbara, I've learned so much with in the last few weeks, just talking about the family constellations and Bert Ellinger's work. You know, these were names that I didn't know uh, recently and so, and I'm somebody who's been reading psychology since I was 13. So I cannot stress enough that there's so much that we don't know. It goes back to that old Socrates quote of uh, all that I know is that I know nothing. I've had those moments and we don't get like a rule book on like, here's a rule book on how to be a parent. But uh, as long as we can come from an authentic heart centered space with our parenting, because we really are always doing the very best we can in every mm -hmm. present moment. Are you ready for another one? Well, I was going to add in one last little tidbit. I mean, just the, uh, I remember watching a video actually by uh, Crystal Shivers. She's also known as Kid of PAS on Facebook. She does a, a lot of short little uh, 10 minute videos on parental alienation and one of the videos that she did that really stood out to me was one where the there was a she was discussing the question about what happens if the child doesn't address you by your uh, parental name, be it mom or dad. Um, what happens if the child addresses you by your by your actual first name, you know? And so there were many, many comments, but the one that she was talking about in that video was this parent would ignore the child until they came back and addressed them as their uh, parental name. And so, you know, like, like, yeah, yeah. So the, the kid come up and be like, Andrew, I, I want, I, I want this, Andrew, I want this, Andrew, I want this. And they would just straight up ignore the child until the kid would come back and say, dad, I need this. And then would, would come in and, and try and serve that parental role. And I agree with Crystal on this, that that is very manipulative behavior. You may think that you're creating a, uh, a, you're, you're trying to assert your, uh, your position as a parent. And you may think that it's, uh, it's a means of commanding respect. I don't think it commands respect. I think it's demanding respect. And to, as a leader, as a parent, as which in, in effect is a leader, you have to know the difference between commanding respect and demanding respect. And manipulative and abusive behavior is demanding respect. And that is always more harmful to the child than you can ever, ever imagine. It ripples out into their entire life. Absolutely. So I think we're, you're starting to move the conversation into conscious parenting. Mm -hmm. and um, something to strive for being a conscious parent, but not always easy when your child comes up and says, oh, hello, Barbara, are you ready? Mm -hmm. um, all right. 
I know how 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 great I know how fast these podcasts go. So the next one is um, pitfall to avoid as a parent with an alienated child. Don't turn every situation into a conflict. Yeah, I think this ties in a lot with the previous uh, the previous point, considering that it's like you were saying, it's a very emotionally charged moment, especially when you see all these stories, these horror stories, you know, on the internet or just in your own research, where there are people who have not seen their kids, not seen, had any contact for years. In my case, I was estranged from my mother for about 13 years. They were in about six and a half year periods. I didn't see or talk to her at all. And so I mean, there was only one instance where she drove up across the entire country just to come see me for a weekend. And, um, and so it, it, when things are so high stakes and you feel like, you know, this may be the last time I see my kid, this may be, I mean, for all I know, they could, you know, go, go somewhere else. They could move to another state or another country. It's a very scary feeling. And with those scary feelings comes these overreactions and the, when, when, because, because the child's going to be defiant, they're going to be rude. They're going to be obnoxious. It's part of that is them acting out the trauma that's unresolved within them. And when we react to that reaction, to their reaction, when we are reacting to their behavior Instead of recognizing that their behavior is a cry for help, we are amplifying that anguish and that pain that's in, in them because we're not focusing on the pain. We're focusing on their uh, ability to be an obedient child. And so instead of focusing on how do you put your child in a two-dimensional box so that way life is happy and, and cheery and rosy because it, Truth is, it's never going to be like that now. What you want to do is start looking at how do you reach deep within that child and find the sources of conflict within them and give them the stability that they need in order to feel better about themselves and about their relationship with you. And to put that into perspective, you want to avoid things where like you're losing your temper, for example, you don't want to be in a position where they can goad you into a fight because they're going to be engaging in behaviors similar to often similar to the alienating parent, which unfortunately brings in a whole nother slew of emotions. They're, they're going to make demands that are unreasonable that a child would never make. You know, you, you wouldn't have a child rationally make a, a demand for child support or a demand for uh, alimony or anything along those lines, but they're going to be echoing these sentiments. And what you want to avoid is putting yourself in a position where you're goaded into a fight. You might, you might hear this in martial arts a lot where they say, you know, when you, whenever you enter a fight, you want to be in a calm, still kind of mind, because if your opponent goes you into anger, you forsake all technique, you forsake all sense of thought, and you start attacking aimlessly, allowing yourself to be easily overpowered by your opponent. And that's exactly what's happening here. So Andrew, you worked in per the, well, you had experiences rather in parental alienation as an ambassador. So did you run into that where, where children were were speaking or talking or asking about child support or alimony? Did you see that happen with other people, for example? Um, I've seen some of it when, maybe not in person, but I've seen it in some of the people I've counseled. I've seen it where, uh, unfortunately, parents were so distraught by their child's behavior that it steamrolled into a violent conflict. And and so not only is the parent traumatized and worried that their child is turning into a violent person, they're also afraid of taking that step again, that trying to be a, uh, in a parent-child relationship. 
in my own experience, I remember being a child filled with vitriol and venom, just wanting to just lash out any time that my mother was trying to build a relationship with me. And the, the impact from that was, it, it just became second nature. I, I couldn't, I never, I stopped thinking about why I was doing it. And it was just, this is what I do whenever she gets around me. And in many situations, like my mother always maintained her calm, but she would always try and make these affirmations. You know, I'm always going to be your mother and you don't, and I don't think that you should treat your mother that way. Um, but at least, but in comparison to a lot of parents who start making demands and start saying, you know, I'm your dad, I'm your mom, you don't treat me this way. And they're uh, beating their fists on the table saying, or metaphorically beating their fists on the table saying, uh, you know, this is not how you should be acting. They're allowing themselves to be caught into this conflict, which in many ways is the whole purpose. Uh, in our, in our first episode, we talked about how the child is going to associate the alienated parent or the estranged parent as a source of drama. And the irony is that they're going to come in, they're going to instigate this drama and then blame it on you. And you don't want to get caught in that trap. Let's go back to your mom. Okay. Now you said she was making some, um, when she was trying to reunite with you or reconnect or establish a love bond with you, at first you resisted, correct? I heard you say, yeah, at first yeah. you were like, yeah. but then when she said to you, and like, I'm your mom and I'll always be your mom. Did that land in a, did that land better for you? That statement? At that time, what ends up happening is because that was her, that was her default affirmations. You know, I could be as poisonous and hurtful as I could try to be. And she would make those affirmations. I'm always going to be your mom. I'm always going to love you. And I understand that you're upset. And what would end up happening is some days I would, amp I would, you know, turn it up and, and be even more uh, spiteful. Other days I would have been calm and just, just let her talk so I could wait for the conversation to end. Some days it just ended up with a hang up. Uh, I just hang up the phone. The, the point was that it, she didn't escalate it. She didn't turn it into a fight. And because she didn't turn it into a fight, I lived my life knowing that I wasn't fighting with her, if that makes sense. Because let's have this little hypothetical real quick. If she did escalate it into a fight, then I would have spent the rest of that time, you know, the rest of the day, the rest of the week, or what have you, thinking about, I got in a fight with my mother again. And it's going to be, I got in a fight with my mother again, because if you get, if it's one fight, there's chances are there's going to be more of them. And it would be this consistent pattern of fight, 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 fight. And when you get into these fights, you know, and you create this pattern of conflict, then when it comes down to the actual point of reconnection, I'm going to look at that track history and say, well, I don't know if this is a good idea. Every time we talk, we have a fight. I love what you're saying because it, it, it's just like hitting me right here and right here mm -hmm. because that, that I think that is how a young person might think about their parents. And so I really admire that when your mother had the wisdom to say, I, I'm your mother. And so that's kind of more neutral, timeless mm -hmm. language, right? So how about this one? Let me know what you think. I'm your mom. Like not to you, I'll, I'll speak maybe to someone else and just a general statement, I'm your mother and I'm waiting for you. I'm here when you're ready. Absolutely, the, you want to show that the door is open and that the choice is theirs to make because we're, we're often living in a world where we try and decide other people's autonomy. And, and in this case, unfortunately, you have what your child being um, having his autonomy slowly be manipulated and twisted into by a very hurtful person. And um, in many other cases, we, we feel our autonomy is attacked in various political matters. The point is that you want to respect their autonomy. 
and you want to give them the opportunity to make choices for themselves. I mean, I understand as a parent, you want to protect your child from, from the pain and the suffering of bad decisions, but once in a while, they're going to make bad decisions regardless of your parenting. And so being there to support them regardless of good or bad decisions in many ways will help them come to respect you more and then take your advice to avoid uh, any conflict or any bad, any bad decisions they may make down the road. The right. thing is when there's no rapport, your, the advice falls on deaf ears. And this healing language that we've just kind of emerged in our conversation definitely keeps things neutral where you can build trust, rapport, and reestablish the energies of love. So I, li I, like, where, I like where this is going. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I'm your parent, I'm your mom, I'm your dad, not you, Andrew, and I'm here and I'm waiting. And yeah, so neutrality, I want to st strive for neutrality. So some good points there. So, okay, so here's, here's a loaded statement, something you want to avoid, a pitfall. Okay, I'll just read it out. It's really painful to read. It says, do not attack the other parent. It's such a hard thing to do sometimes. You know, you for many parents, they, they fell in love, fell deeply in love you know, and thought they were, they found the one, they had a child with it, with them, and then everything went wrong. And then not only did everything go wrong, they lost so much. They've lost money. They've lost their time. They've been emotionally, sometimes physically um, uh, abused uh, there. And on top of that, they go through this rigorous divorce process. And then that drains them of more money and more mental energy. Some people give up their careers to get into marriage and to build a family. And so now they've had that lost time as well. And so there's so much anger and grief and loss in a divorce and in, in these broken relationships. And so of course, yeah, I get it. You, you, want, you want that other person to know how much you suffered. And I hate to break it to you, but they don't care. <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> <laughs> That's true. They don't care. So yeah. we have to turn all the energies of caring back towards ourselves. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, so I like to we, say that. <laughs> definitely. And, and I think this is more in your field of expertise, Barbara, but when, when it comes down to that and you have all that emotional tension that's just twisting and bottled up inside you have to find ways to uh, grow past it, or you have to find ways to care for yourself and heal. What kind of healing methods would you recommend real quick? Well, I mean, since, okay, so I guess what you're saying is in order to heal it, we have to bring consciousness to it, our own consciousness to it. And the first step is bringing awareness to it. That's one important step is becoming aware. But since we're talking about these emotionally charged situations um, where you might not be able to like just call on the energies of awareness and the energies of mindfulness because you feel like attacking the other parent, like in the heat of the moment when, when you're in a fire and, and someone's poured gasoline on it. I would probably recommend a little strategy that that's not my own, but it's from the Distress Tolerance Center and it's called STOP. So it's just a way to uh, self-regulate in when you lose your point of balance or when in these emotionally charged situations. Do you want to hear it? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> stop. Definitely. Stop means stop. So uh, take a step back, observe, and then proceed mindfully. But the STO, the stop, take a step back and then observe, that gives you time to actually reflect and proceed mindfully. So, you, you know, just a little tool like that when you're running into the other parent at school and you know, feel like driving your car into his car or something, then stop, you know? So, Definitely. Or, or, you know, even with your kids when they're, um, triggering you. Definitely. And I think uh, just to tie in to our second episode, we, I would definitely incorporate the BIF strategy as well, uh, as far as the, that proceed mindfully strat, um, portion of the, 
of the STOP acronym, especially yeah. when you're dealing with the high conflict people, you're going to want to think to yourself, you know, will this get me what I want? Will this get me a better relationship with my child? No, then, well, then you don't actually, that's such a powerful question. If you can become mindful enough in that moment and just get even a bit more present to say will this get me what i want and unfortunately in those in those moments sometimes it's, it's a bit more challenging to do that but will this serve my outcome um, absolutely and especially if the goal is to detangle yourself from that person or from that uh ex-partner you know sure you had your you had your great moments and you now you've had your bad moments but now is the time to start looking towards a newer future for yourself. And Definitely. do you want them in there? If you want them in there, then keep doing what you're doing and keep yelling at them. But if you want them to not be a part of your life moving forward, then this is the opportunity to stop, look within and find ways to move forward for yourself and minimize the contact that you have with them. Absolutely. And Andrew, I think, I think that what you're saying is truly wise and it's, it's resonating with me. And, and I think, you know, I wrote a little ebook called Erased by a Narcissist, uh, mm -hmm. a one woman's journey, divorcing a high conflict personality. And there's just a little part in there where I say that children may start emulating their parents' high conflict tendencies or their parents' high conflict personality. So I just, well, I just mentioned that because we shifted to parent parents but we're really talking about alienated kids, but it's hard to separate it all out because Definitely. it's all part of the system. Yeah. And I can imagine that some, some listeners might say, well, I mean, how am I supposed to de-entangle myself from this ex when they're constantly attacking me and they're constantly uh, attacking my kids or they're constantly trying to initiate conflict? How do you do this? And a lot of that really does boil down to the gray rock strategy, the Biff strategy that we've talked about in previous episodes and the importance of not engaging in that conflict because the moment you do, you're, you're getting roped into their game. Yeah, well, you know, um, stepping back and having those self-regulation tools to step back or remove yourself from the game. I mean, just a little simple saying that shifted everything for me was what you give power to has power over you and I was giving so much of my own personal power away and my own personal truth was just getting clobbered down that I you know um I was engaging when I didn't want to engage so guilty as charged <laughs> all right and so one, oh, la one last little bit just for this one point because it's really important the goal at the end of the day is to build a relationship with the alienated child or to prevent them from going down a, a route of further alienation. And so with that goal in mind, remember that that parent is still 50% of them. That parent is part of their creation. And so when you attack that parent, you are going to be attacking 50% of them. You, you don't, and if that child yeah. sees you attacking them, that parent, if you're- percent of that child, mm -hmm. that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, yes. And so if the child sees you attacking that other parent, they're going to see that, you know, okay, well, maybe this parent's no different than the other parent. You know, why, why do I want to have a relationship with a parent that's full, of, that I already associate as drama? Why do I want to associate with this parent if they're going to just attack my guardian angel parent, which would probably be their alienating parent, unfortunately. Yeah, and I mean, I agree. And but first of all, it erodes the child's sense of self worth, because they subconsciously genetically epigenetically realize that they're part mom and part dad. So then it because that's how children form their sense of self worth is firstly through bond with mom, or bond with your parents. So yeah, on a serious note, on a more serious note, I saw something quite beautiful where a parent, say a dad, said to their child, like, I love you and you're beautiful, or I can see your mother in you and that part of you I like, or I love to see 
your mother and you in you, you know, and just to say something like that to your child, like I see your mother in you and that's okay. Um, might be a very healing, affirmative, form of language that you can share with your child and it might not really be easy I didn't know I was going to be referencing my little ebook but this one might be really tricky for people I like to make this light Andrew but if you were to take a picture of the other parent and have it in your home I don't know how many parents could do that that is a very healing action you could take to just balance your whole family system what are your thoughts on that, Andrew? I think that's a, it's a very difficult thing to do. And I can see why many people who, are, who might be listening will say, oh, hell no. And then just saying, absolutely not. But uh, right. it's, it takes courage to do so. It takes a lot of courage because it'd be something that you would look at and you would have all those emotions just kind of surge up like a volcano. And, you know, and you're going to have to recognize that those emotions need to be worked through, that they need to be resolved internally in order for you to have your power. Like you just said, what, what you give power has power over you. If you give yourself that power to heal through this, nobody's going to be able to topple you or, or throw you off balance. Yeah, because no one, can, no one can heal you but you. No one can tell you how to parent really honestly, but you, you have to parent authentically and um, no one can change you, but you, those type of things. But yeah, I mean, for anyone listening, consider it, consider putting a picture of your other co-parent in your home. I challenge you to do that. I can't even blush without saying it, but that <laughs> is one beautiful healing step that we could all make to stop alienation and bring more unity and restore the orders of love in our family. Are you ready for the next pitfall? Let's go for it. Okay, so don't involve your children in any of your legal discussions. I think this one pairs in a lot with the, uh, the attack in the other parent simply because the process of divorce is already gonna be a very emotionally charged moment for the kid. And depending on their age category, they may want to find someone responsible. And so when you involve them in the legal discussion, you are bringing them deeper and deeper into this uh, hellhole or hellscape of, of family court, and it will hurt them more in the long term. This is a dispute between yourself and your ex not a dispute between the child and the, and the parents. So and rather than engaging in that, you just acknowledge this is, you know, your mother and I, or your father and I don't agree on certain things. And we've reached a point where we need to start taking actions to separate, but that that's, you don't involve them in anything deeper beyond that. Right. Well, hopefully those actions are non-family court oriented actions because there are other ways that you can find resolution, make agreements besides heading down to the local family court. Mm -hmm. A little sidebar. All right. So do you feel complete on that one? I mean, it's pretty basic. I mean, we don't, and you, you really don't want to drag the child into that world because it, it makes them feel worse about the entire situation. Uh, everyone feels worse when there's high conflict legal discussions or high conflict legal battles or, you know, um, high conflict affidavits or you get into an attack defend cycle in family court. Um, so it's such a such a shame sometimes that families spend years and years and years in family court and then it becomes more difficult to keep this separate from your children. But this is a common a common no-no is, uh, and you, you hear it in many places, don't discuss legal stuff with your children. Especially if the child is being, in, uh, being contested for custody, you can imagine just how much they would hate being the center of what's being fought over. And then to involve them in that discussion is just twisting the knife. Yeah, family court is a big knife and it's a very, in my view, a very unloving system. So if you can avoid it, and sometimes you can't, 
uh, any family court knives are going to into these unloving systems um, is something to take into consideration because it is possible. So uh, I'm getting serious now, Andrew. Okay. Do not, this is on, on our list here, do not interrogate your child. So again, this is in the context, of course, of parental alienation. And yeah. uh, so interrogate your child. I'll let you speak to that, Andrew. So oftentimes you might have, like I said, when we were talking about the, the parts on uh, not engaging in manipul manipulative behavior, the interrogating your child and asking them so what did you do at mom's place did you have did, did you guys do anything and then you know did she get you anything for your birthday you know asking questions about their relationship that is in effect invasive will harm your relationship with your child i remember this would happen a lot with my stepmother and how she would treat her extended family it was a, it would be, you know, I would go to like a family Christmas party and she would not show up because she had fallouts with certain family members. And then I come home and get interrogated and like, so was this person there? Did they say anything about me? What were they doing? But did they have fun? You know, who'd you talk to? And it would just be this nonstop, endless questions of like, well, I mean, if you wanted to know these things, just go there. <laughs> and <laughs> so how, how, <laughs> Okay, so and and so when you bring that, how did that impact you when when you were the receiver of these questions? What did you do? Where did you blah blah blah? The the thing was, I wanted to be there with family that I enjoyed being with. I wanted to enjoy the festivities. I wanted to eat good food and talk to family that uh, that, like I said, uh, that I enjoyed being with. I wasn't there to be a spy for her, and you don't want your child to feel like they're this third party spy between parents and you don't want them to be bouncing back and forth and reporting on the other activities of the parents. Unfortunately, alienating parents will do this to their, to their child. And so it is not uncommon to have your activities being reported to the, to the other parent. And unfortunately, this does put you under a spotlight and in many ways, some regular habits, you know, a beer in the evening can turn into an accusation of alcoholism, a, you know, it, or just taking a few meds for a certain health condition you might have may turn into an accusation of drug addiction. It's unfortunate because these are going to be perpetrated by the alienating parent. Um, I just, I just want to step in and support you in what you're saying, because uh, to some that might sound far-fetched and to others listening there, they know that that and worse may happen when you go into family court because that system rewards this this type of false accusation making where um, unfortunately so these things do happen what you're saying I, I find to be very relevant mm -hmm. and just to really wrap up this point it comes down to the again the number one question of this episode is what's most important and the answer is bonding with that child you know, building those, uh, building that bond, creating those memories, something that they can hold on to when they leave your place, um, whether, whether they're living with you or not living with you, you want them to have those positive emotions and things to hold on to. And so if they're I mean, memories, just a little bit, right? Yeah. Build on the 1% or Absolutely. the 2%. Mm -hmm. And if their memories of time with you is an interrogation, they're going to look back when you try and make contact with them and say, okay, fight, fight, interrogation, fight, fight. I, no, I don't know. No, thank you. Please, please. No, thank you. And that's then a, they're going to walk away. That's a good point, Andrew. I, I think you're bringing some really, really relevant points from almost the perspective of the child. Um, yeah. Which leads us to our next pitfall to avoid in these sort of uh, breaking the bond of parental alienation statements. Uh, do not deny your child's emotions. One thing you might see a lot in the parental alienation community is when a child is angry or they're acting out their unresolved conflict within themselves or their unresolved emotions within themselves, they might echo some sentiments that 
would be said by your ex. And you do not want to counter this with statements like, you know, you're talking like your mother, you're talking like your father. You know, you don't want to say you're just angry because your mother said this. You're just angry. You're just upset because your father said this. You don't want to label their emotions as something that was imprinted on them. They're going to feel that their emotions are legitimate, whether they know that or not, isn't going to help you in this instance. And it sounds counterintuitive, but the thing is, what you need to do is go beyond the anger and go into the roots of where that anger is sourced from. And the answer is it's not so much sourced in the programming done by the alienating parent. Rather, I would argue it's the unresolved anguish they hold within themselves. They, if a child believes that they are at fault for the divorce, they will hold on to that. And that is what's going to lead to these acts of estrangement. If they believe that uh, they're not loved enough as a result of the divorce, then that's where you might get a different set of actions in, in the estrangement. And so what you want to do is target those, those, those roots in, within them. It's because, it, it, again, it's not about the alienating parent. It's about the child. And once you shift your focus from a, a point of addressing the alienating parent within the child, and you shift it to addressing the child within the child, you are then able to start a different process, a process of healing and a process of building rapport versus fighting the alienating parent that's programmed in their mind. Yeah, well, I think you just hit it on the nail on the head there when you said shifting your focus from the alienating parent just to your, your own child, as long as that's in your, whatever is in your control, mm -hmm. and then applying this healing language, which is neutral, and these loving actions will take you farther faster in building trust rapport and reuniting that love bond with your child. And just Absolutely. obviously it's undisputed. I think we can all agree that children need both parents and that they love as long as it's healthy and that they want the love of both parents as well. Unfortunately, the child's going to be bringing in a lot of unresolved emotion. It could be the manipulations of the alienating parent. It could be their own feelings of the divorce. At the end of the day, your goal is to see past the emotions, see past what they throw at you and go straight to the uh, source of anguish within them. And once you're able to develop a habit of doing so, you will be able to really show them that you understand them. There's a saying that I, I remember coming across and I can't remember who it came from, but it was something along the lines of, people don't want to be understood, they want to be felt. And it's one thing where you can understand why the child is acting this way. You understand that they're being manipulated. You understand that they're being abused at their other parent's house and being interrogated and being told all these hateful things about you. It's great, we all understand. The thing is, it's not about understanding right now. Right now, it's about emotional intelligence and being able to go past what they throw at you, all the insults, all the hateful comments, all the accusations, go past that deeper within themselves, within, you know, we always talk about the child within ourselves. They're going to have one too, to the child within the child and giving that child the assurance that you're there to build a relationship with them. You're there to love them and you're there to guide them into their adult life. Well, that's beautiful, Andrew. And, and really, I mean, how healing would it be to say that to your child and how healing for any child in any circumstance to hear that from their mother or their father? And yeah, this is, this is good stuff. I mean, because this is really, really the worst of the worst. I mean, this is yeah. painful, a painful journey. And that's why also too, um, how do we get to those healing sentences, those healing languages, it's just becoming more conscious and healing. So great time for me to just put in there that why not get support to get there? 
with, mm -hmm. you know, a psychotherapist or a coach, um, someone to guide you through it, because sometimes just having a guide, um, whether it's a coach or whatever, whatever modality you choose can bring you to consciousness quicker and, and reveal your blind spots in your own energy field because this, this is really difficult stuff to navigate alone. In fact, no one should be alone during divorce, dealing with a narcissist or parental alienation. It is it's definitely when the time when you need a, a community and loving, loving support team behind you. Absolutely. So, yeah, so a um, little side note, we had talked about something pretty relevant in our social media world, which was don't don't take screenshots of your conversations with your kids or your ex and post them on social media, which at first to me was like, well, who would do that? But apparently it happens a lot. Oh, it Did definitely does. Before, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and then we were talking about earlier when we were doing some prep about how your child, whether it's pre-adolescent child or teenager can make fake profiles and actually see what you're writing and sharing or venting or posting on social media. So just yeah, a little, maybe a little point there. It's definitely very easy, especially if the, the user is unaware of the social media privacy settings. It's, uh, it's very easy to, you know, just have a default settings and allow the rest of the world to see what you're put, what you're putting out there. And this really ties in with that earlier point of don't attack the other parent, because if they see that, they're going to think that you're guilty of all the things and accusations that are being thrown at you. Yeah, and, and sometimes some of these statements and don't post things on social media may seem like common sense, but when you're under heavy fire and, and down you know, in some of your darkest, hardest moments, you, that's when you lose sight of, of all of these things, which now seems so logical. So having a support team, a loving support team, in addition to your hopefully loving legal team can ease the way and, and show you the way forward. Since we are a solution focused podcast, and hopefully too, um, once the healing's done, it allows you to be more future orientated. We created, Andrew, you created an incredible acronym to help you become more resourceful in what you're facing. Okay, so the acronym is LOVE, and L for listen, or even loving listening. So the acronym is LOVE. Yeah, we just want to listen. We want to give the child the chance to say what they have to say. It might not be positive things. It might be very horrible things. You still want to give them the chance to say it. Let them get the words out, let them get the emotions out. And that way, you know, you have an accurate way of saying, okay, this is where they're at right now. This is what they're feeling right now. Whether it's true or not is irrelevant right now. We're not going to talk about whether or not mom or dad is a drug addict because they take pills for their health condition. We're not going to talk about whether or not mom or dad is an alcoholic or mentally unstable. We know those are not true, but right now we need to address what they're feeling. And we do that by just taking a step back and just listening to what they have to say. And sometimes your child just might say, because of the circumstance, something as simple as, I hate you. And mm -hmm. of course, no parent, uh, I hate you, mom, or I hate you, dad. So it could just be as simple as that too. So listen, loving listening. Mm -hmm. So we take the time, we step back, we listen to them. Then we start looking at opportunities to bond. That would be your letter O in this acronym opportunities to bond, what does that mean? Well, we want to look for, once we know what's ailing them, what's hurting them, we can start looking at how do we build rapport with them? And you can, whether it is behaviors that are upsetting them that you need to change within yourself, or if you feel that they are uh, associating you with a false personality or they're associating you with these negative characteristics and you want to demonstrate that you are not that person these are ways to build that rapport build opportunities to build rapport opportunities to bond with your child and Beautiful. 
And the other thing you can do is uh, maybe it's not hateful insults. Maybe your child is saying, you know, I don't want to hang out with you right now. I want to play video games. And then you can say, okay, instead of saying, well, what about my time? What about, what about the, all this fun stuff I've planned for you? What about this birthday party I planned for you? Instead of jumping into that conflict, you can start saying, you know, and you're looking for these opportunities to bond. You start saying, oh, you want to play video games for your birthday? Okay. I mean, uh, what kind of video games are you playing? You know, and then you can start looking at trying to build a discussion with them. So op- that would be opportunities to bond. Yep. Yep. Engagement. Okay. The next step would be valuing their opinion. And a lot of this pairs in with the listening bit. You want to value their opinion. Their opinion could think could be that you are the worst person in the world. Their opinion could be all these hateful accusations. I'm not saying that just because you're valuing their opinion, you are saying that they're true. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that you are giving them the chance to say what they said and address it as if it were a valid argument. Now, again, you have to be concrete and rooted in yourself. They're going to call you names. They're going to say hurtful things. And you know those are not true. But you're going to address them very calmly and and address them in a way that is peaceful, neutral, and constructive. And then and that leads us into our last point, which is empathy. And it really wraps everything up in the sense where you know they are saying these hurtful things. You know that they're being uh, ang- they're, they're really angry, that they're unhappy, and they're looking for reasons to get away from you. So you've given them the opportunity to speak their mind. You've maybe looked for opportunities to build rapport with them, and you've shown them that you value their opinion. The last part is to dig deep. And this really ties in with what I was saying with the listen part, dig deep, look at the child within the child. What are the emotions they are feeling? What is, what are the fears they have? What is, what are, where's the pain in their anger and start addressing those parts of them. And then you'll start being able to build that relationship with them. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. So we, we just touched briefly and to bring this all together that we also love the book, Gary Chapman's five love languages. Um, but with respect to your children. Yeah, yeah just a, a quick recap on Gary Chapman's five love languages for the people who have not read it. There are, I mean, he basically summarizes our interactions into five types of five love languages. There's words of affirmation, acts of service, quality time, material gifts, and physical touch with uh, words of affirmation. You know, these are the I love yous. These are the you're doing great. You're an awesome. You're doing an awesome job. Uh, thank you. It, these are the thank yous. All of these things are positive ways to demonstrate that you care for someone. More subtly, it could be the drive safe. It could be the call me when you when you get home, um, and uh, or the you're handsome or you're beautiful or you're a princess. All of these things are where words of affirmation or just i'm proud of of you i'm proud of you absolutely Mm -hmm. it's probably the one the one i the most important one i missed thank you barbara (laughs) that's okay we all love to hear that i'm proud of you Mm -hmm. and so the next one would be acts of service so with acts of service these are the little things that you can do to help them get something done maybe you Maybe you, if your kid is older, you know, you uh, help them change their oil in their car, or change their tires in their car. Maybe, uh, you know, you recommend them to somebody who's an expert in some sort of field that they need help in. Uh, or maybe you help them file their taxes. You know, acts of service is just a, a small way of building that relationship where you can help them with a certain task maybe they know or don't know about and you're just getting them along and it it it's very subtle but it's a great way to build rapport uh, next one would be quality time quality time could be as simple as watching a movie together just talking having a conversation eating ice cream together it doesn't really matter it's just a matter of being present in the moment 
and being there with your child and giving them your full attention. Mm. Number four, uh, material gifts. Material gifts doesn't have to be something outlandishly expensive. You don't have to buy them a new car. You don't have to buy them the next video game console. You don't have to go out there and spend a ridiculous amount of money. It could be something small and, you know, it, whether maybe if say your kids are going for college and you're strained for them, you buy them a few pots and pans as, as a hot, as a apartment warming gift. Maybe if you are uh, more artsy and you wanted to paint something for them and you could paint a painting for them. Yeah. Um, or if you did want to do something financial for them, setting aside college funds would, would be a great way to do so oh, as well. Oh, it's good. Yeah, I guess it's just building meaning, meaning something meaningful in that gift. Meaningful. Yeah. And some of the best gifts are the ones that didn't cost money. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the best gifts are the ones that don't cost any money. Uh, It's the ones that you could put on your shelf or your nightstand or or on on the counter. And you just see it once in a while. And and you say, oh, hey, yeah, I remember that. You know, it's my mother or my dad gave me that. Just small little things, small little reminders that you're there and you care and you love for them. Um, And then the last one, physical touch doesn't have to be in in the in this case with the child obviously these are your hugs your kisses your head pats your fist bumps uh they're all just small subtle ways of just saying of providing uh emotional support and physical connection showing that you're actually there that you're tangible you're going to support them you're going to catch them when they fall you're going to shield you're going to try and shield them from any harm or danger just to recap like bringing consciousness to our field to heal, trying to integrate and send out not only healing vibes, but using that healing language, which is often very neutral, powerful healing language. Um, But to get there and do all of that, you have to maybe open up to resourcing yourself and getting support more support you might need more support than you've ever needed through this so we highlighted a couple of examples of powerful healing language and the neat thing is is that you don't even have to say this directly to your child you can say it to a picture just one sec i think i have a picture right like i I actually that's me (laughs) but you could have a picture of your child if you didn't see your child and you could use this healing language with your child and um, just to give the credit to Mark Wolin for these sentences that a parent or mother or father could say to his or her child. Um, I can't show you this in real life, but I can give it to you now. I guess if that's if you're separated. I couldn't show you love then, but I can show you love now. It's true. With all that was going on, my attention got pulled away from you when you needed it most. You needed me, and because of all of the stress, the fighting, fill in the blanks, it affected you. I'm your mother, or I'm your father, I'm here for you now, I'm waiting for you. Some examples of healing language that you can energetically put out there. Uh, It doesn't have to be that you literally say this to your child. You can actually actually just use a photograph, just have it, you know, buy it. You can actually just send that out into our galactical universe. Um, Definitely. And I know some people might see that and be like, oh, well, I mean, I don't want to just talk to a photo. This won't do anything. This won't fix anything. And I want to kind of warn that those people who might feel that, that you don't want to take away your opportunity to work through the emotions that you are having as a result of these different situations, be it parental alienation or the high conflict people that we're dealing with, you want to give yourself the chance to work through those emotions. And so don't knock it till you try it. And so great to and, know that you don't need the person to work through it. I mean, mm-hmm. I, if, if, you are, if you have an issue with your parent, you, you don't actually need your parent. It's better if you can work through it with the person, but if you can't, you can still work through it. Thank you, everyone. And that is all we have time for today. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. And if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to our channel, either on YouTube or through our podcast. 
Uh, don't forget to use the downloadable document below. It'll have all of the things that we talked about earlier and it'll help you and your loved ones deal with all of these challenges of alienation, trauma, and high conflict. Barbara, if people wanted to contact you or go about, how would they go about reaching you? Uh, BarbaraLapointe.com and ebooks also available as a totally free download, BarbaraLapointe.com. Alrighty. Yeah. And uh, if you want to contact me, you can find me at my website at andrewfockler.com or just email me at startnow at andrewfockler.com. And as always, thank you for taking the time to be with us today at the Broken Family Podcast, where we discuss and help you find solutions to divorce, parental alienation, and high conflict relationships. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.